Good afternoon. Welcome to the Engineering and Construction Webinar Series. I'm your host, Eric Mucklow, at the headquarters of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Today, we'll be having a presentation on Uniform Specification 0191.00.15, Total Building Commissioning, including the role of the CXG and the CXC. This is part two of the series, which describes the commissioning process when using the specification section. Today's speaker, Brandon Martin, is the chief of the mechanical design uh, at the Louisville District, and he develops and maintains the local Louisville District specification sections and business procedures related to commissioning, tab, and sustainability, and assists HQU SACE with guidance regarding building energy conservation and commissioning. Brandon is a certified building commissioning professional and a member of the Commissioning ENS Center of Expertise, instructor for the Prospect HVAC TAB course, and Access Commissioning Authority and or specialist on multiple projects. With that, I will now turn it over to Brandon. All right, thanks, Eric. Hello, everybody. Um, we'll talk about the total building commissioning spec. Uh, as Eric mentioned last, we did a part one of this uh, series. That one was uh, specifically aimed at just an overview of the spec, what's, what's in there. Um, there's a lot of about the mechanics of the specification, how to edit, tailoring options. I'm going to touch on those just very briefly today because uh, they are very confusing. Um, and uh, but, but today I wanted to focus more on what, what did the CXC, uh, what, what did the contractor's commissioning uh, specialist do, what does the contractor do, and what does the core do uh, in the commissioning process when using this particular specification. So we're going to talk about the roles and activities and documentation uh, required of the construction contractor and the commissioning specialist. And we're going to describe what the, the core is commissioning activities uh, also related to the specification. And uh, when you see um, CX, that means commissioning. I just get tired of typing commissioning all the time. So uh, don't get confused. CX means commissioning. Uh, ECB 2015-6 is a total building commissioning uh, ECB, um, that's pretty close to expired now, if not already, but uh, we are working on ER uh, that uh, incorporates the requirements that were listed in that ECB, so pretty soon those will be uh, part of an engineering regulation, those requirements. This, this uh, diagram you see in front of you is pulled right out of the ECB, and it's just showing uh, in design build on the lower right and, and design build on the upper left that in uh, the way the CCB was put together, the construction contractor is hiring commissioning specialists um, that will handle the heavy lifting of commissioning. Uh, and that's in both design build and uh, design bid build. Uh, you can see the relationships there. In both cases, the core, we provide oversight, so we should have a commissioning specialist on our side that's helping to uh, provide some level of QA of that uh, activity. Criteria, this, this all stems from the High Performance Disabled Building Guiding Principles, but the, the hard requirements are in the Army Policy Memo that came out in 2013, and in UFC 12002, they point to ASHRAE 189.1, and they conform to those commissioning requirements there. And as I said a minute ago, the, the Engineering Regulation Systems Commissioning Procedures, which was published in the 90s, is being updated to incorporate um, some of the newer requirements. It's a pretty good document already. I think it just needed to be updated slightly. Uh, and I will say, uh, well, let me talk about applicability. This is this is real. Uh, the spec is really meant for new construction and major renovation. If you have a very minor renovation project, the spec is probably going to be uh, quite a bit of overkill for those projects. So they probably need to be heavily edited for minor renovation. Um, and if you have questions about that, feel free to contact me if you want recommendations about what to do. But uh, you'll see why it's probably overkill for very small projects. It applies to Army, Air Force, and Navy. NASA has their own commissioning specs. Do not get confused. Uh, the number is the same, except it ends in uh, 0040. That's for NASA. Ours ends in uh, 15. So. And I did want to point out, we worked with teams uh, across the core. We worked with uh, NAVFAC. Uh, we got comments from the Air Force. So this document 
everybody has their own opinion about how commissioning should work. Uh, they've got uh, best practices that, that they've run in across. They've got lessons learned from, from different projects, different levels of complexity. Um, everybody's been burned in different ways in construction, so everybody has a different way they'd like to approach commissioning. So this spec is not going to be what anybody considers the best solution. It's, it's a compromise uh, where we try to take the best of, of everybody's different perspectives and and create one document to uh, hopefully satisfy 85 and 90 percent of of the need. By no means do we uh, think any of us think it's uh, perfect. You can find the specification at Whole Building Design Guide, wbdg.org. If you go down to the lower left hand side of the page, uh, there will be popular links. Click on the Unified Facility Guide specifications. There's two files available. You can see the line at the bottom there. There's a PDF and there will be a specs and tax file. You can also click the Criteria change request link and put if you have a problem with the way this, uh, the specification reads or needs more language or whatever comments you have about it that need to be something you can uh, help us correct, you can put in a CCR um, and eventually somebody will look at that and uh, address that. Uh, just bear with me the slides. I think I'm missing the button to press the slide sometimes. So. Tailoring options. The spec can be very confusing, um, if you're, especially if you're not using specs and tax to edit the specification. There are tailoring options. There's 10 tailoring options. So the specification can be automatically edited for design build versus design bid build for Army, Air Force, or Navy. The Navy has two different ways they handle commissioning, so there's two additional tailoring options for that. The Navy still uses uh, the old 23092301320, I think that's the right number, but the old backnet control spec instead of the new one, whereas the Army we and Air Force were using the newer specs. And there's another option for building envelopes. So there's a lot of options in there. The beauty of Specs and Tact is that you can select the options that apply to your project, and it will automatically edit the document to a large extent for that. The downside is if you're looking at a PDF document, which you can get from Whole Building Design Guide, it has every single tailoring option, all the text from all the options listed. So it's got conflicts, redundancies, uh, organizational issues, sentences that don't read right. So I just want you to be aware if you pull the PDF that it will not uh, look right. Uh, you really need the specs and tax file. I have, I have copies of the uh, of PDFs that have been edited for specific scenarios that I can send out uh, to anybody that uh, will send them out to the community. Is that okay, Eric? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, that way uh, you can look at PDFs that make a lot more sense. Uh, the spec is meant to be edited for both design build or design bid build. It's simply clicking a tailoring option. Uh, in this case, for design build, the RFP preparer uh, edits the specification and it becomes part of the solicitation package for design build. We're not letting the contractor post the award his designer of record edit the specification. This is meant to be part of the contract, not a uh, design package after the contract's been awarded. The owner's project requirements document should be included in that um, specification when edited for design build. In no case should we be letting the construction contractor post a award, write a document that tells us what our requirements are. We're already writing an RFP. All we need to do is convince the, relative, the relevant information into an OPR and combine that with the uh, put, go ahead and put that document in the solicitation package. And make sure it's for information only so that if you have a conflict, uh, it's not part of the contract. It's just for information. For the rest of the presentation, we're going to concentrate on the design bid build rather than try to cover both sides of um, both possible acquisition methods. Lead. Lead was not a driver at all on creating the specification. With that said, almost all of the, I would say all and more uh, requirements necessary to meet lead are in the specification. Um, so, uh, just realized the team that put it together, we, we were not really thinking about lead that much except as a really kind of an afterthought, but ultimately all of it meets lead requirements. There's a paragraph in the spec that's, that points back to the uh, sustainability reporting spec, which outlines the documentation requirements for the project. 
So there's only one small paragraph of that lead in the commissioning spec. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about CXDs and CXGs. These are uh, discussed in ECB 2015-6. I highly recommend if you haven't looked at that and you're interested in how the process should work, go back and look at that ECB. Uh, we'll talk a lot about it today, but that, that really outlines what we expect. Uh, the CXC is the contractor's commissioning specialist. The C at the end stands for contractor. CXG is the government's commissioning specialist. The G at the end stands for government. So shouldn't shouldn't be too hard to keep that straight. Uh, what we expect in, in the specification, we require that there be a commissioning firm identified. They are a first tier subcontractor, meaning they're hired by the prime contractor. They are not to be hired by another subcontractor. They shouldn't be hired by the designer of record. If it's design build, they shouldn't be uh, hired by the mechanical subcontractor. They need to be hired by the prime contractor. Uh, that commissioning firm uh, has a what the special all the specialists needed for the project. They'll have a lead commissioning specialist, in this case, LEAD lead. They're in charge of the whole project. They're really our, our main POC for these projects for commissioning on the contractor side. And then there's sp different specialists that are required. So mechanical systems are uh, the, most of the, uh, the technical work is handled by a specialist that's uh, skilled or competent to handle mechanical systems. And likewise for electrical and also for envelope if you do envelope uh, commissioning. I just uh, I think we'll get to it later, but I just want to point out envelope commissioning is an option in this spec. Some people feel that the 07 specs that talk about air tightness and uh, tests and air barriers are sufficient. Others don't. Uh, that's why it's an option. So for your project, you can decide whether you want to roll all that up into a single under a single umbrella, under the commissioning umbrella, or if those 07 specs uh, meet the needs for the project. Uh, so then the government specialist is an employee or, or one of our contractors. We can hire them through an AEIDIQ or some, whatever means we have to get to those people, or it could be an employee. I per, personally prefer having an employee unless we just don't have the manpower or we have a very complex project and we need special competency. That person is uh, helping uh, ensure the commissioning process runs the way it should. So the... Uh, Commissioning, the contractor's commissioning specialist performs the bulk of the commissioning work. They prepare uh, the uh, commissioning plan and the test plans, the test scripts. They oversee execution. They're the one that organizes the contractor's forces. They provide reports. They do all of that work. Uh, in this scheme, the government doesn't have a third party or separate person uh, preparing all that work. Our role is more of a quality assurance role uh, for the commissioning process. So the government specialist ensures that Early in the project, we're moving the correct direction. We're going to we're going to follow the correct criteria. We're going to implement the correct specifications for commissioning. They're going to uh, provide quality assurance of the commissioning process during construction, meaning, hey, is this process actually happening the way the spec requires? And if you uh, if your CXG is, is has enough availability. Um, you want them to do the technical QA. Sometimes we have separate people in the field do technical QA. Uh, so you might have a separate guy looking at all the mechanical systems for construction, or the commissioning uh, specialist for the government could do that. However you want to structure that is fine. So uh, the commissioning QA involves looking at reviewing the qualifications that are submitted, looking at commissioning plans, and any documents submitted under the commissioning uh, umbrella, and they, they make sure training uh, is happening and O and M related documentation comes. The to do technical work is reviewing equipment submittals and shop drawings, looking at test plans and reports. Uh, they may perform inspections and they may show up and attend some of the tests. So, so the government, besides the technical QA support, the government specialist is really needed to help navigate the commissioning pro uh, processes. Many people have trouble. With it. Commissioning is somewhat complicated in, 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 in these processes, and so this person is to help navigate those processes. And, and the reason is well, different acquisition strategies are applied to all kinds of different projects. We've got design build, design build, build. We might have two or three different contract standard, uh, standards for uh, design build. Uh, the complexity of projects are different. You know, a small renovation project probably doesn't require uh, a lot of uh, effort on the part of the CXG. 
a laboratory or a hospital or something like that provides requires a lot of oversight. Customer preferences play into this. Uh, and, and the extent to which third-party sustainability certifications plays into the complexity of all this, these commissioning requirements. In addition, the, one of the reason, another reason we have to have these guys is that commissioning affects the critical path of projects. I've heard that complaint all the time. You know, so at the end of the project, we don't have enough time to uh, finish commissioning the project before the beneficial occupancy date. We need these guys on board looking at the schedule, looking at the activities that are occurring, and uh, making sure that commissioning is staying on track, staying on schedule, that everything has been planned out correctly ahead of time, and things start going off track, they can help you think up or uh, come up with solutions that both help get you back on track for schedule and keep your, the quality of your product uh, within uh, reason. There are uh, many trades and subs that makes uh, connected with commissioning that makes this complicated. There's multiple specification sections that play into it. There's tab controls, uh, HVAC specs. Um, some of the other systems aren't quite as complex, but there's a lot of specs that have a lot of test requirements, and, and there's some are prerequisites to others. Someone has to be aware of those and make sure that we're uh, doing everything in the correct order. So, uh, just. Presentation note, when, when something shows up in orange, it's the core of any government specialist uh, requirements. So. Communication, uh, let me go to the next slide. So in the specification, it, it does state that the contractors, commissioning specialists can communicate directly with the core of engineers, uh, contracting officers rep. Um, it doesn't say it explicitly that they could communicate with our government uh, commissioning specialists to the extent the field offices want us to do that. Uh, that means we can talk back and forth without going through the construction contractor. Also, the plans, reports, documents generated by that uh, commissioning specialist come directly to the core. They don't. They do not go through the uh, quality control um, uh, system manager or that staff. They should be provided in parallel so that those submittals can be tracked through QCS, uh, and uh, it, it, those are formal submittals. They need to be tracked appropriately, but we get a, a parallel, a copy in parallel. And the intent is to avoid uh, having the QC staff or the GC filter the content provided by the commissioning specialist or censoring that commissioning specialist, and uh, uh, not allow them to influence inappropriately the uh, the uh, commissioning specialist. So we're trying to mitigate the fox in the hen house issues with uh, having commissioning under the uh, general contractor. Oh, and should be noted uh, also, while we can communicate with the specialist, we can't direct the specialist. Um, we don't have contract authority directly with that specialist. Systems that are to be commissioned. I'm not going to go list these. Uh, you can read them, but the white. The systems in white are all required by ASHRAE 189.1 to be commissioned, which means uh, so the UFC 102 requires compliance with ASHRAE 189, which requires commissioning all these systems if we have them in the project. The yellow systems are additional systems that we list that the UFC does not cover, but, but a number of people uh, wanted to have some of these systems under the commissioning umbrella. A lot of times it's associated with hospitals or very complex projects. The ones that are in bold, uh, in white, HVAC building automation system and building envelope, we have checklists, example checklists available for that online. Uh, we don't have checklists for the others yet. Uh, there is a project underway to try to build a, a checklist library for uh, examples. So in, in the specification, the specification editor picks the systems that need to be in the spec. We should never just go with the default list of, spec, of systems. They need to deliberately pick out the systems that need to be commissioned. They, that needs to be in accordance with the uh, UFC requirements. They can add other systems as appropriate. So the, the power distribution, power generation, for example, they can add as appropriate. It, and they just select those that are already in there. We should delete any systems that aren't, are not in the project. So if you don't have irrigation systems, delete them. And uh, it, there are other systems not listed in the spec that could be added. Sometimes fire suppression, elevator controls, AV systems, things like that are included under the commissioning umbrella, and that can certainly be added by the specifier. It may also mean that additional paragraphs have to be added throughout the spec to handle those special systems. 
So what does the, the government uh, commissioning specialist do? They start, should start hopefully in concept design. Uh, that's during the planning stage, but that's sometimes impractical. They need to ensure that we're complying with the UFC and help the, the team determine which systems are appropriate for the commissioning uh, process. During the design phase, after assigning the CSG, we need to ensure that uh, the minimum commissioning requirements are being met. We're adding on requirements uh, as warranted by system complexity, so it's a very complex system. The commissioning specialist may say, hey, we probably ought to add power generation to this or uh, AV systems or whatever they feel like is necessary. Sometimes customer preferences play into this, so they would help you judge uh, how to handle those. Um, and they can uh, review the specifications and make sure the contract is uh, correct before it goes out. And here's a whole list of commissioning, construction phase commissioning activities. I'm not going to read these off. We're going to touch on many of these as we go forward. They're just provided as a reference for you guys if you want to look back at this presentation. But all of these are either touched somehow in the spec or they're uh, referenced as milestones that need to be in the project schedule. Project schedule. Uh, we're not requiring an extra project schedule. It's the same schedule required by 013201. Uh, there's a whole list, and this is not an exhaustive list shown here. This is a very short uh, truncated list, but a lot of milestones are required to be shown in that project schedule related to the commissioning process. The reason is, it looks like overkill when you look at the spec, but the reason all of those are there is because at the end of the project, the project suffers because nobody's thought about all these activities that have to happen, what order they need to happen in, and how long it really takes to do all this. So everybody's behind at the end of the project, then we want to cut quality, either indirectly or directly, uh, in order to make a schedule. So what we want to do from the beginning is make sure we understand all the activities that play into this, we understand the order of events, and we understand how much time it really takes to do all this uh, before we get in trouble at the end of the project. Contractors, commissioning specialists should be reviewing that. We don't require that in the spec. Maybe that was, a, that was probably a bit of an oversight, but they should be checking that out. They have a vested interest in uh, making sure that commissioning runs smoothly. And then on the government side, we should be reviewing to make sure the tasks are uh, listed as required, that they're in the correct sequence, there's available time for all of them. Commissioning firm uh, qualific and specialist qualifications are required. You can see here, you can look at the spec or look here at what qualifications are required. Just, you know, this happens pretty soon after uh, NC notice to proceed for construction. Uh, every um, specialist has their own set of requirements that all have to be satisfied. Do no later than um, 30 or 60 days after notice to proceed. That's a selectable option, so your um, very small projects, 30 days may be sufficient. Large projects, it might take that long just to get the subs on board, uh, 60 days or more. So uh, we need to uh, pay attention to what the contract says for this. Uh, the core office should review to make sure that uh, they match the specs. The, the 6G, the government specialist doesn't necessarily need to look at those unless there's a deviation. And then you may want to ask whether uh, to allow the deviation or not. There's a coordination meeting. should be happening 14 days, though. So Within two weeks after approving the firm and specialists, there should be a meeting to talk about the lines of communication, roles and responsibilities, schedule, logistics, inspection and test procedures. It should be attended by the contractor's uh, superintendent or project manager, the CQC staff, um, at least one representative, and the core should be attended by, we, we should invite the user and the public, work depart, public works department to attend. And the government specialist should at least call into the meeting to make sure that all the points that, uh, that need to be talked about are discussed. And they can provide lessons learned to the whole group about communication, documentation, and logistics. So these guys, once they've gone through a few projects, are probably going to have some pretty good lessons learned to help avoid problems on future projects. There is a design review requirement. So this is design bid bill. So this requirement exists on design build also. But even post a word on design bid build, we want the commissioning specialist to look at the design again. We're going to leverage their experience and see what they can find. And we want to do this early in the project so that if we find anything that has to be modified, we know it early, we have the money for it, um, we can go ahead and get it taken care of, mitigate any schedule issues early if 
we don't want to find out while we're testing the system, if we can help it, uh, that we have a design issue that needs to be fixed. So um, we want these guys to look at the design early. Um, let's see. You can, and they, they are required to provide a report listing any de de uh, deficiencies. And then we're supposed to have a meeting to discuss those deficiencies within uh, two weeks after receiving that report. The commissioning, uh, the government specialist should review the report to make sure that the commissioning specialist is reviewing those designs against the uh, owner's project requirements and basis of design. And they may or may not provide technical advice to the core regarding the deficiencies, if that's what you want them to do. Contractor specialists uh, develops and maintains an issues log. That's how they track deficiencies and the resolution. This is independent from Qu uh, QCS, our QCS system that the Corps uses to track deficiencies in construction. Deficiencies should still be tracked in QCS. As in fact, the specification requires that anything identified in the issues log be tracked through QCS also. But the intent of having a separate document is so the specialist uh, is the one uh, holding the line on any items that come up. So regardless of what shows up in QCS, that commissioning specialist should be keeping items open until they really are resolved, independent of what the contractor does in QCS or the core does in QCS. Um, let's see. They issue that log monthly, and then uh, the government specialist should make sure they're keeping track of when the issues log is supposed to come. The, they need to be proactive about it. So set a reminder in Outlook. It comes up, oh, we're supposed to be getting the issues log right about now. Check on the status of that. If somebody's not doing that, we may not get the issues log for months, and nobody will notice. Uh, what's the kind of commissioning specialist doing during that time? We don't know. Uh, they need to be checking uh, for any, um, based on anything they know about that's gone on in construction, they need to be checking the issues log to see if it's being uh, captured. Uh, they need to help the field office identify any issues that might need to be addressed by the AE firm or by the district office or other people. Uh, they need to be making sure that this stuff's being tracked in QCS and flag items that are not being resolved uh, as quickly as they should be. We did a uh, interim construction. So there's there's two constru um, construction phase commissioning plan submittals. One is an interim. It goes through the schedule. Uh, it's really about logistics, communication, um, schedule, controls and responsibilities, those kinds of things. And there's a template. Um, there's checklists in there for the building envelope if you do envelope commissioning. And it's too earlier because the building enclosure goes up fairly early in uh, construction. After, you know, after some time after site is going, then we start the building enclosure. So this needs to happen early, 30 days after the commissioning coordination meeting. Um, if there's like some lag in that coordination meeting uh, and between uh, getting that started and we're getting close to building envelopes going up, uh, that plan is due for at least 14 days prior to the start of the building envelope. And the commissioning specialist for the government should be reviewing that plan. Let's see, the, the, the template inspection checklists are available. They include uh, items that verify building material construction, maintain thermal moisture integrity, uh, there are examples online that the specification points to a site online where those check, uh, example checklists can be pulled down. There's an example of what's in those checklists. You can look at this uh, at your leisure uh, or you know, go to the spec, pull, uh, go to the website it references and you can go see the same thing. The uh, commissioning team members, team members need to be identified in the specification. There's Separate one for the building envelope. Um, specialists, uh, so, so on each system, envelope, electrical, mechanical, we identify the correct commissioning specialists. We have a USACE quality assurance rep identified, contractor QC representative identified, uh, the contractors identified, and you may or may not have the designers participate in some of these activities. The specification will say to what extent on design build, the, the designers have to participate in design bid build, build. It may be listed in there if there's Title II services or, or if that may exist, we may still put the designers in there. Uh, the customer representatives are part of the team. They, they are listed as being uh, available or um, they should be invited to any of these activities. We did a final construction phase commissioning plan. Um, 
If the NRA plan is updated with any further information, the, the, the meat of it is the pre-functional checklist, which are inspection checklists, functional performance test checklist, and integrated system test checklist. These are the test scripts. So at the, when we get to final, it'll have all the test scripts and inspection uh, checklists that we're supposed to have for the project. Those prepared by the uh, contractor specialist. Do no later than 30 days prior to starting inspections of the system. The government specialist should review them to make sure they reflect the level of detail required, tailored towards the project, so that they actually are meant for that project and they're sufficient. Here's uh, the website where those checklists can be found. The specification references the, um, let's see, actually in this case, uh, you'll have to look at the spec for where the example uh, checklists are uh, on the online. This is about, uh, we, we have a project ongoing to develop checklists, um, provide as examples, and uh, you can contact uh, commissioning at usace.army.mil as an email. Um, if you have checklists for systems that you'd like to share, uh, send them on. Contact them first, they'll tell you how to handle them. Oh, here's the site. This is the website to go to to uh, find the example checklist uh, that are referenced in the contract. Uh, and that's, uh, so you, when you pull it up, it looks like that. It's a CDS file. Um, down here at the bottom, 0191001515. The, the examples we have are over here in the right, there's zip files. Just click those and they'll come right up. There's examples, uh, screenshots of uh, some of the examples of functional performance test checklists. They're pretty detailed. These were developed by NASVAC. Uh, they're pretty nice, but they're, they're pretty detailed. So uh, they could be several pages long for uh, a test of, say, an air handling unit. Here's a uh, more of the same. Really. Okay. Well, construction middles. All right, so we're getting, we've gotten past the plan, the commissioning plans, uh, design review, the commissioning plan, coordination meetings, and so forth. Uh, now submittals. All uh, equipment submittals, shop drawings, and test plans that are rel related to the commission systems have to be provided to the commissioning specialist, uh, the, the contractor's commissioning specialist. And they're reviewing for compliance with the contract and the basis of design and owner's project requirements. It does not replace their quality control staff uh, review or an AE review. So if we have an AE who's going to be reviewing the commissioning uh, specialist review doesn't replace any of that. Commissioning, um, uh, the government specialist uh, may be make, ensuring that checking on the contractor specialist to make sure that they're getting the submittal that they're supposed to be getting. And if there are any deficiencies listed, those should be showing up in the issues log. Um, they could be, you could have the government specialist also review the submittals for uh, technical issues. Building envelope inspection. What's involved with building envelope inspection is uh, the commission specialist provides a template checklist. The checklist identify all the items in that particular construction. Uh, that have to do with thermal and moisture integrity and air tightness. Uh, the contractor, uh, subcontractors are, are marking off um, those items as they build the envelope. The uh, specialist, contractor's uh, commissioning specialist for envelope goes out there at least twice to inspect the, the construction at two different points and make sure those checklists are being uh, kept up with so that uh, the contractor's not just pencil looking over at the end of the project. Uh, and also, this uh, um, specialist should uh, attend the air tightness test and witness note those. Now, in the 07 specs that cover air tightness and air barrier, uh, there are requirements for an inspector and a test agency. Uh, this person could fulfill those roles as long as they meet those qualifications. So if they meet all the qualifications in, in the, the different specs, uh, they can be that same entity. That's probably what will happen. Uh, the specialist, our go government specialist, uh, makes checks in with the field office 
and the lead spe contractor is fishing specialist and ensures the building envelope specialist is getting to the site. Uh, and the government specialist should review the checklist once they're submitted to make sure they're being completed. Uh, you might have a uh, technical, the, the government specialist attend the building air barrier test if you feel that's necessary. Um, or you could have an architect or just one of the time reps or, or field guys that are good with uh, air tightness testing with them. Pre-functional checks. These are the uh, inspections of generally the HVAC systems, plumbing, lighting, uh, renewable energy, any of those uh, active systems. Some contractors uh, check off all those items on checklists, pre-functional checklists. They are submitted uh, within seven days after they finished inspecting all items. Uh, they also have to be um, checked off by the commissioning specialist for the contractor. And they should include the manufacturer's startup checklist. The government should, uh, specialist should be reviewing at, uh, those submittals or those checklists for completeness so that they did they really uh, complete all the checklists? Uh, did anybody fail to sign off on any of this stuff? And you might want to have the government specialist come out and actually perform an inspection as part of the technical QA. Tab uh, assessing adjusting and balancing uh, needs to be complete and verified, and controls performance verification tests have to be complete prior to functional performance testing. So there's two specs. Tab, there's a tab spec and a control spec. They have test requirements that are tied in with conditioning. All of those test require, requirements have to be completed prior to final testing under conditioning, the functional performance test. The uh, mechanical commissioning specialist for the contractor has to review the pre-final tab report or draft tab report, attend the tab verification, and provide a certification with the final tab report saying they witnessed everything and everything looks fine. Uh, they also have to review the startup uh, test and performance verification test procedures and reports that are required by the control specification. Uh, and they provide certification that no deficiencies uh, are reflected by the report. So when you get the PVT, the performance verification test procedures and reports and tab um, reports, those should come with a certification by the commissioning specialist saying that everything is cool. So the government specialist should review uh, to make sure that the mechanical contractors, mechanical commissioning specialists got copies of the reports and that we have certifications of those reports. We should get a certificate of readiness from the contractor and the commission signed by the uh, commission specialist, the uh, superintendent or PM for the contractor, quality control staff, and the subcontractor saying everything is ready for functional performance study. We need to have this before we allow them to schedule the functional performance test. We need to make sure we review it quickly uh, to avoid holding up the functional test. The uh, government specialist should obviously review that certificate, make sure all the prerequisites, all the test reports and procedures have been met prior, that are required prior to that functional performance test. Uh, <clears throat> There's a note there, given all the prerequisite inspections and testing, so there's a lot of inspections and testing that lead up to this final test. If the systems have major deficiencies that cause the functional performance test to end the project to be aborted. The contractor likely failed to execute inspections and testing adequately. So basically they have poor quality control. If you do all, all the different testing along, and they have a specialist following all this along, at the end, if you're at the final test and things are going really poorly, they have really poor quality control, or they lie to you when they give you a certificate of residence. The functional performance tests are tests of all sister calibrations, control responses, safety, uh, basically how everything works. It's, a it's considered a final test. Uh, it progresses from um, uh, subcomponents to components of equipment uh, all the way up to systems and interlocks and connections between systems. So it starts from the bottom up. Uh, sampling that's required. Uh, design to build, the specification will say what the sample size is for different systems or different types of equipment. So the, the, the person editing that spec should have indicated what the sample size is uh, in the specification. The design build uh, projects, the default is 100%. And basically that's because it's hard to bid a sample that can continue to grow if there's deficiency. So we just say, hey, we're going to test 100% of everything. And if you want to, as a core employee, or, or, or I'm sorry, a, um, 
managing the contract allow a sample instead when you get there? Uh, I have no problem with that. Just make sure you com you work with your government commissioning specialist and that they agree that, hey, yeah, we, we can get a, uh, use a sample and that would be adequate. There are uh, requirements in the specification for uh, handling failures and retesting the software. Let's see. The, uh, these tests are led by the technical commission specialist, so the, the electrical specialist will handle lighting, renewable energy, and in many cases, any kind of power distribution or generation uh, systems. The mechanical will handle HVAC, plumbing, irrigation, those kinds of things. Uh, the checklists have to be signed off by uh, each of the ten team members that are uh, identified in the spec that are required for functional performance testing. The test can be aboard <coughs> if we're missing a member from the contractor staff. Um, and a core, core may decide to allow them to continue anyway. So if you're missing the electrical subcontractor when it's time for HVAC testing, you might let that slide, but you might tell them, hey, we need that guy available uh, by phone and he needs to be able to get here within 15 minutes. Uh, whatever, however you want to handle that, but the test, the spec actually lets you abort the test if the electrical guy is not there. Uh, and if any system deficiency prevents successful completion. So if you're going along and you're testing uh, and you hit a point where I can't move any further with these tests because of some deficiency, the spec allows five minutes to fix something. And if you want to, uh, and it takes longer than five minutes, and, and for whatever reason you want to, you can abort the test, and then you come back later for retesting. Sometimes that's counterproductive, but we did need a hammer, because otherwise you could just be going out there for uh, retest after retest after retest. And basically making up for poor quality control. We highly attend the government specialist to attend those final tests. As the core representative, they're making sure that the tests are complete, they're adequate, uh, they can verify, they're a witness, and they can verify the system's work, and uh, they can help advise regarding whether a boarding test is smart or not. So, uh, highly recommend they show up. You may have a, requ a need for seasonal or deferred tests, so sometimes weather conditions are not suitable for the function performance tests. In that case, we need to defer testing until appropriate weather conditions uh, exist. Uh, sometimes, uh, if a project has certain performance requirements that are very critical, uh, the specification has a provision in it, it's, it's optional, that allows a test in both the peak heating and peak cooling systems during out-of-the-way air extremes. So they have a requirement that, hey, okay, we're in the fall when we do functional performance tests initially, so we may have to come back in the middle of winter to do a test and come back in the middle of summer to do a test. So there's a post-construction requirement that could be a bit of a challenge with the uh, contract closeout and hitting metrics and so forth, but it may be necessary to achieve the proper quality uh, for the project and give the customer what they need. Uh, not always will that be required, but it may be required in some cases. Uh, there is a requirement in here for post-construction performance monitoring that might be adequate in, in a lot of cases uh, rather than the peak season testing. Uh, let's see. Moving on, integrated systems tests, so functional performance tests sometimes aren't, isn't being in. Sometimes we have integrated systems tests. So once we've tested the HVAC systems and we've tested power distribution systems and lighting systems and fire systems, we may have to test the interactions between them. That's normally done anyway with fire and HVAC, but sometimes if we have UPS systems and, and power generators, we need to test to make sure the lighting systems respond correctly and the HVAC systems respond correctly when they're under emergency power. There are cases where HVAC systems operate differently when they're under emergency power. So we need to test those. Those are called integrated systems tests. And there, uh, that's optional. It's kind of a bracketed uh, test in the specification. So it's up to the specification editor to decide if those tests are necessary and, and to what extent. And those are guided by checklists just like functional performance testing. They have the same requirements regarding aborting tests and sampling. Um, so it, it follows the same processes as functional performance tests. Training plan. The contractor is required to develop a training plan identifying all training required by specification sections. So that may have already been covered by another spec, but a lot of the technical specs have requirements for training. What this does is require the contractor to give you a list of what all the training that's required in those specifications, and uh, they talk about uh, what's going to be in that training, the training
container name and content, schedule, and location. I think we do this usually anyway. It's required at least 30 days prior to the associated training. What we need to do is have either the, our own quality assurance rep or our government specialist, commissioning specialist, review to ensure that uh, we captured all the training requirements that are in the specification. They need to document training uh, using a uh, training attendance roster. This is the middle. So after seven days after the training is completed for each system, we should get a, a set of rosters for that training. Um, so this is one where it's driven by leads that, that we for sure have to track that training actually occurred. And this is one way to prove that that has actually occurred. Commissioning report. Uh, the report needs to include an executive summary describing how everything went, are there any outstanding issues or deficiencies or any other activities still outstanding. So you may get, you'll get this report uh, soon after all the problems that are found in functional performance testing or integrated systems testing are complete. You may have some outstanding activities like uh, seasonal testing and some post-construction performance monitoring, um, but you'll go ahead and get the report before then, so it'll list anything that's still yet to be done. It includes uh, a lot of the documentation that's been generated along the way. So we, we've had uh, submittals for design review reports, commissioning plans, checklists, issues logs, and so forth. What this does is require them to roll all that into a single submittal so that that's one part of something we can hand to the users uh, to uh, help them maintain and operate the facility. It also is something we should maintain so that we have to do something with the building later, we have problems later, we have all this stuff in one spot and can find it hopefully easily. That's probably wishful thinking. But. Uh, systems manual. Contractor has to prepare a systems manual. It's not an O&M manual. Operation and maintenance manual um, could be part of the systems manual, but what this includes is a basis of design, a narrative basically of how the system should work, single line diagrams showing how the systems are laid out, as built sequences of operations um, and control set points. Full warranty information should be included. Recommended retesting um, schedule and form. So it would say, hey, you really ought to retest these systems every three to five years. And here's some forms you can use to retest them. And uh, schedule for uh, uh, sensor and actuator calibration. Do 30 days after functional performance tests are completed. Functional performance tests are completed when all issues discovered during functional performance tests have been corrected and retested. Just uh, keep that in mind. And it should be reviewed by the government specialist for completeness. In the Army, we're required by uh, the Army sustainability policy to provide these maintenance and service life plans required by ASHRAE 189. Contractor prepares the plan. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but they, uh, you can read what that's about. That's a submittal we get uh, concurrent with the systems manual, and uh, the government specialist should be reviewing to make sure those are complete. And then post construction, we have an endurance test uh, required, and, and it's a optional thing the, the, the specifier can um, pick or delete. It depends on whether we think uh, we can apply, if we have the money to do this, and if construction, um, if the contract management side of things will support this. Uh, the contractor sets up trends um, in the system at peak cooling and peak heating system season. So they're going to set up trends and for a period of uh, so many days, I can't remember how many days off the top of my head, we get, and we have trends of how the system operated during that, those, those um, peak seasons. Um, the mechanical specialist, the contractor reviews those and provides us a report um, that's due uh, within two weeks after they've received the data. The government specialist should review those trend line reports, help confirm, um, they're helping look at that and confirming that design, construction, and operational issues are, are, well, let me put it this way. We may find design issues, we may find construction issues, or we may find operational issues, and they're helping to determine which are which. Uh, and then they also do some technical work and, and tra help troubleshoot uh, any issues that are apparent. A site visit is performed by the commissioning specialist, the contractor specialist, uh, concurrent with the nine-month warranty walkthrough. So when you do a nine-month warranty walkthrough, the commissioning specialist should be there. They should be talking to the O&M staff. They 
need to be identifying deficiencies uh, that they see when they're there and proposing corrective actions, and they will update the system's manual and commissioning reports. Uh, the government specialist might attend the site visit. They don't have to, um, but they could be there to help provide additional technical support. And they definitely need to review any uh, updates to the system's manual and commissioning report. That's a lot. That's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, obviously, go back through the, the PowerPoint if you uh, have any questions. Look at the specification. Uh, I'll send, again, we'll send out the PDFs that are tailored for Army. And um, let's look at that ECD and that ER. Do we have any questions? Uh, yes, folks, uh, if you will type in your questions in the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, I will consolidate and read them aloud to the presenter and for the sake of the recording. And um, to start, we have one that has come in already. Getting back to the uh, building envelope, uh, building envelope being a system that is part of the total building commissioning uh, required as the SDD policy that you mentioned earlier in the UFC 1-202. Can you explain where parts of that process becomes uh, optional for the building envelope commissioning in, the, in that UFGS uh, if, you're do, if you're dealing with um, like a warehouse or something that's not feasible to undergo the air barrier pressure, pressure testing and, uh, and otherwise where it's required? <laughs> well, that's more of a technical question about air barriers. I think I'll have to... Uh defer that, uh, but we can, um, who is it out, Eric, you may know, uh, who is it out in, uh, that's been working on the air barrier guidance? Oh, Nicholas Alexander? Yeah, Nick, Nicholas Alexander, he may be the best person to talk to you about that. Okay. Uh, I will say in the relative to the specification, uh, there are o, uh, 07 specs that cover building the air barrier and pressure testing. Um, and this isn't answering that question, but maybe another that might, someone might be thinking. Uh, those require, have the air barrier requirements. I believe the proponent for all this at headquarters feels that those are sufficient for building envelope commissioning. So that should satisfy the requirement. Uh, others uh, disagree, and so we provided the building envelope uh, commissioning requirements in the specification as an option. Um, in case the project delivery team feels that they need to have that rolled up under the larger commissioning umbrella. So that's pretty wishy-washy, but we made it so that it could go either way. Okay, so you included it as an option in this spec, um, not to say that it's a, it would be an option um, if it's required in the other specs. Right, if it's in, if it's in the contract, so it could be in the 07 spec, right. to do the pressure testing and the inspection this commissioning spec might not say anything about building envelopes, mm -hmm. in which case you, you only worry about what's in the 07 spec, or it may say also follow these requirements, and, and so there are additional requirements in addition to ones in the 07 spec. Right. I think <coughs> that would be something that the uh, PDTs or the, or the spec writers, actually the design team, would have to make sure that they, that they include um, somewhere, they include the building envelope commissioning um, and make sure that the two are, are not, that there's not an incongruency between the two spec sections. Um, if one says it's optional and one says it's required, you know, in two different places or something like that. Um, right. It never says it's optional. It's just that, that the spec editor could choose to roll it up under the larger commissioning umbrella or, mm -hmm. or we could choose to, to decide that the, um, the air barrier requirements and inspection requirements in the other specs are sufficient. Yeah, but the, uh, the the CXG is um, if it's still required in the in the Division Seven section, the CXG is still going to be in that team, right? Would he have? CXG could, uh, yeah, they, they could either be additional to those people that are required, test agencies and inspectors in the other specs, or it could be the same person as long as they meet all the qualifications. Okay. Because um, we do want an, an integrated process, and the, the CXG should be. Uh, you know, tracking that kind of thing as well. Um, the uh, CX plan. What, what the, there's another question. What differs, if anything, in total building commissioning requirements or specs when doing a design build project versus a design bid build project um, for medical facilities or others uh, such as Air Force? Uh, sound a little like two questions. The design build, uh, really there's not a lot of difference. All it does is, is move um, 
the design review requirements, in the spec at least, it moves the design review requirements into the design phase rather than following design. Uh, and a uh, design phase commissioning plan is developed uh, during design. So it, all it does is shift some of these requirements that are already in the spec uh, forward a little bit. Uh, as far as the difference in hospitals and other projects, um, I don't know if I want to get into that today. That, 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 you know, <laughs> obviously hospitals are more complex. This, this specification is, um, may, it, it may be okay for hospitals. Uh, if you're government specialist, you may want to hire a contractor as your government specialist who's experienced with hospitals and, uh, and has the time to really dig in and uh, do a, pro a good job on uh, following the commissioning process. Hospitals are pretty intense, so a lot of times core employees don't have the time to do that for, for something like that. So it would be appropriate probably to have a good uh, a specialist that's uh, digging in pretty hard. On the other hand, I do know that, that MedCom sometimes requires a third-party commissioning specialist anyway to uh, do some of the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different procedure, so this effect wouldn't necessarily fit that particular uh, customer preference. I hope well, that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know if the medical facilities uh, was just a uh, an example, uh, randomly or specifically, uh, but you know, for the uh, ask for that question, we do have the um, a whole lot of medical expertise and specialists in the core um, that if you're doing a hospital or a medical facility, that you know they should definitely be in the loop and be able to give you guidance because they have a lot of uh, parallel universe requirements um, that are that are applicable to medical stuff. Um, and now someone says that the uh, I'm not sure what if they might want to elaborate on this question, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, you said the systems manual SM is developed by the contractor. Does this mean that the contractor selects the appropriate writers of the system manual? Okay, good, good question. So uh, in the Army version of this spec, when it's uh, edited for Army, the contractor can, can select who uh, prepares that uh, system manual. That could be the commissioning specialist or it could be others. Um, we left that open. Um, on the Navy version, they specifically wanted the commissioning specialist to prepare that document. Um, the way we've done it in the past here in Louisville was to have the contractor do it and then the commissioning specialist reviews it. Uh, in the Army version, it's the same. Uh, whether he whether the, he prepares it or the commission or the contractor has someone else prepare the document, the commissioning specialist provides a certification that it's complete and uh, sufficient. So there is a requirement in spec for them to uh, give us that certification. Okay, and, and maybe it's different. I thought there might be something else behind that question. Um, so, uh, folks out there, if there are any more questions, I think I've uh, going to scroll back and make sure I didn't miss any. Um, apologize if people had technical difficulties along the way. But uh, we are at the um, top of the hour. There's one more question on uh, on BAS trending. Who decides these things. What is trended? Oops, I'm sorry, it's jumping around. Um, question on BAS trending. Who decides what is trended, the sampling rate, how data will be provided to reviewers? Also, is it possible to require that the trending be started in advance of the verification period? Okay, so uh, all right, good question. Uh, there is a requirement for trend logs to be prepared prior to functional performance testing, but it's in the control specification. So this spec is piggybacking off of our UFGS control specification. The newer ones have, and the old ones, but the newer ones have trend log requirements that occur, an endurance test that occurs during performance verification testing. Um, it will specify what trends and what points and, and, and all that we need to see. I think it says all points that are in the, identified in a point schedule to be trended are required to be um, trended and that it may or may not provide a sampling rate as far as you know number of um, points per, per minute or something like that. The uh, post construction also piggybacks off that. It, it, um, it, go, it points to the same endurance test requirements and says now do the same thing um, during uh, post construction at these particular times. So it's, it's really just leveraging the control spec and whatever it says about uh, trend logs. And I think, again, whatever is identified in the point 
schedule for controls uh, to be trended, all of those points have to be trended, and uh, it may or may not give a frequency and duration. Okay. Um, the only other question is if we can have the uh, PowerPoint um, downloadable somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure if we can put it on the Mercy site or if it's – I thought that there was some button somewhere in this menu up here that somebody could click to download a document once we shared it, but I don't see it right now. Um, if not, if somebody – if you want the uh, presentation, just uh, – Email me, uh, Eric Mucklo, uh, at usace.army.net, uh, .army.mil, or, uh, or of course the S underscore E webinar, and uh, we'll try to send those to you. Um, not really seeing the download button right now. We're using AT&T now. Uh, yeah, I did want to say again, uh, the tailoring options are complicated. We'll send you a PDF. We'll send out a PDF of uh, these things tailored for Army to make it easier to read, but, but if there are any questions about what the spec says and how it's intended, uh, feel free to contact me. Right. Oh, yeah, your email address is right there on the screen. Um, it's being silly. Um, okay, so I don't see any more questions, and we are at an hour, so um, I will turn off the recording and, and wrap it up. Uh, Brandon, as always, excellent job. Um, I think a lot there's a lot of interest in this subject, and I'm glad to have you back. And um, and thank you for uh, for being our presenter today. Thank you.